You're blinking? You're blinking. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Alex. I am teaching Physics 260 this year, Modern Physics. If you are not in Physics 260, you are in the wrong place. Um, I'd like to begin um, just by uh, going over a few administrative details for the course. I just handed out a syllabus. Um, if, does anyone not have one? If someone does not have one, you probably don't have one. Um, uh, this just contains some administrative stuff that I'd like to go through. Um, first things first, I'd like to introduce our TAs. Jean Bernard here. Jean Bernard. Ah, there he is. Uh, Jean Bernard and Marius will be the two TAs for the course. Um, their roles will primarily be to hold office hours, to answer questions that you might have, uh, to grade problem sets, um, and to write the solutions for those problem sets. Uh, their contact information is here uh, on uh, the syllabus. Also, my contact information is listed. Um, my phone number, my email address. Um, I don't use my phone number. I mean, you can use my phone number, but it's not going to do you nearly as much good as using my email address. Um, that email is the preferred method of communication for the course. Uh, you guys are welcome to sit around, to stay around if you want. But, uh, you can go eat lunch if you want to eat lunch. Um, uh, the rest of you can eat lunch, too. Oh, that's fine. As long as you bring enough to share. That's the rule. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so let's see. We meet three times a week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1230 to 130. Uh, occasionally, I will have to uh, be out of town during one of the lectures, uh, in which case I'll find someone to give an alternate lecture. Sometimes these are super special secret surprise lectures uh, on special subjects outside of the main uh, part of the course curriculum. Uh, unfortunately, to this Friday is one such day when I have to miss class, but I've already arranged a makeup lecture. Um, I think there might be one or two times uh, throughout the semester. And generally, uh, if I do have to be out of town, I'll arrange for someone to come and give a lecture just because, you know, I know that you guys are so excited about physics that you couldn't bear the thought of missing a class. Uh, so, um, and if I can't do it, if circumstances arise where I can't find an alternate lecturer, then I'll probably cancel class. Uh, but hopefully that won't uh, have to happen. Um, let's see, communications. Uh, if you are registered for this course, I have your email address. Um, that's the email address, your official McKeel email address that I'll be using for course announcements. Uh, so check your email um, because if I get hit by a bus and need to cancel class, that is the method by which you will find out, unless I'm dead. Okay, in which case I don't care. Um, uh, you can come to class anyway. Um, let's see. If you are not registered for the class and want to just sit in for fun, that's great, that's fine. Do send me an email so I can add your name to the email list, though, because uh, you'll also want to know if I get hit by a bus. Um, also, occasionally there will be type, if there's a typo on problem set or something like that, uh, and I need to let you guys know, um, I will send that all out by email. Um, there is a course webpage uh, listed on the syllabus. There's lots of good stuff there. Um, among other things, as you may have noticed, uh, I lecture uh, in a slightly non-standard way uh, using this tablet, as you can see. Um, that means that all of my lectures are recorded uh, by the computer. Uh, so uh, on my course webpage, uh, after, after each lecture, I will post uh, the written course notes that you see right there and also a recording of the lecture. Uh, so if you have to miss class, uh, that's fine. Uh, you can just look at the recording. Uh, the one caveat is that I can't guarantee that I'm going to record every lecture. Uh, this is an old computer. Um, it crashes about one out of every 10 lectures. So um, skip class at your own risk. I mean, I don't, you know, I have no emotional attachment to you guys attending class. If you want to go uh, skip class, that's fine. Uh, but you will learn more if you come to class. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, like I said, if you need to get in touch with me, email is the best way. I try to answer all emails within 24 hours. Um, uh, I've listed office hours here, Fridays, 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, if you need to come talk to me, um, office hours are a guaranteed way of uh, knowing that I will be free to talk when you stop by. You can always try and stop by my office some other time. Uh, more often than not, I'm probably uh, in the middle of something, and so I might tell you to 
uh, I might set up an appointment at some other time or tell you to come back, ask you to come back during office hours. Um, if you can't make office hours, uh, the best thing to do is actually send me an email and set up an appointment uh, so that I can make sure to be around and be free. Um, let's see, grading. Um, there are three uh, components uh, to your grade in this course, uh, problem sets, midterm, and the final exam. Um, the problem sets will be handed out weekly, um, Wednesdays uh, in principle. Um, that was at least my idea. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, and I'm really letting you guys down by not adding out a problem set today, actually. Um, but I decided that I would be nice and give you the first week off. Um, so probably what I'll do is uh, on Monday I'll hand out a problem set. Um, that'll be due the following Wednesday. So I'll, in general, be handing out problem sets Wednesdays. They'll be due the following Wednesday at the beginning of class. Um, if you finish them early, you can always turn them in by putting them in the Physics 260 uh, mailbox in the Physics Department uh, mailroom. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, work together on the problem sets. I have no problem with that. Um, your colleagues are a great resource. There's no better way of working through material than working through it. Uh, together uh, uh, with other people. Um, however, um, your problem sets uh, should reflect your own work and your own understanding. Um, some of the problems that I'll be using will be similar to problems that I uh, used last year when I taught this course. Um, and I did hand out solutions to problem sets last year. Uh, so it is possible that those solutions are floating around. However, uh, you are not allowed to use uh, the solutions from last year's problem sets. The use of those solutions is considered plagiarism. Um, if I discover it or suspect it, I will treat it as plagiarism. So consider, unfortunately, uh, in the past I haven't made that announcement, but unfortunately, um, the situation, you know, based on my previous experiences, I feel like I do have to make that announcement. Um, uh, let's see, uh, if you uh, can't turn in a problem set on time uh, and you have a, a valid, important, good uh, reason, then uh, me, the TAs and I are happy to grant extensions. Um, but if you want an extension, you need to contact us before the problem sets do. Um, if you don't get an extension, we take off points for lateness. Uh, we do hand out solutions for the problem sets. Um, and once I hand out solutions for the problem sets, I don't take a late problem set because I think that wouldn't be fair to all the people who turned in the problem set on time. Um, there's a midterm. Um, it will be in class at some uh, future as yet undetermined date. There will be a final. Um, the final will be scheduled by the uh, brilliant uh, computer that schedules all of our final exams at this university. Um, prerequisites. So um, I will assume that you've had basically a year of uh, freshman physics. Um, if you were in the U0 program here, that means roughly 131 and 142, or um, roughly sage up physics. Um, I will also assume um, a solid understanding of calculus, uh, linear algebra at the level of vectors, matrices, uh, and so forth. Um, for example, I'll assume that you're taking Math 222 concurrently with this course, uh, or that you've taken it before. Um, and more generally, um, I'm going to assume that you're all uh, part of the U1 Honors uh, Physics program. So how many people here are in the U1 Honors Physics or Math Physics program? Okay, my computer's asleep. Raise your hands again. Hi. Okay, good. Um, you know, for those of you who are not in the U1 uh, Honors Physics program, uh, that's fine. Okay. Um, you're welcome to take this class. That's great. But you should be aware of uh, what is expected. Um, and in particular, um, this class uh, is taught at a higher level um, and uh, at a faster pace than our standard undergraduate uh, physics classes. Uh, you should be prepared to do some reading on your own. Um, you know, I will uh, do the best I can to teach you everything you need to know, but you're going to have to supplement that and you're going to have to do a little work on the problem sets, more so than in a standard undergraduate class. Um, let's see. Um, oh. I will also assume that you're taking this class concurrently with Physics 251, which is the mechanics class. How many people are taking Physics 251? Good. Okay. Uh, if you're a U1 honor student, that is 
that you, you should have just raised your hand. Um, I do coordinate a little bit with uh, uh, Robert Brandenberger, who teaches that class. And in particular, um, one of the text, the textbook for that class is one of the textbooks that I will be using for this class, um, as I'll describe in a minute. Um, maybe I can just um, ask a couple words about prerequisites. How many people have already taken multivariable calculus? Okay, good. If I say, if I ask you to, to if you know, how many people know what a Jacobian is? How many people have taken a linear algebra class? Good. How many people, um, if I say hyperbolic cosine, how many people know what that is? Okay. Good. If I say e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta, how many people are really excited by, by that statement? <laughs> how many people are aware of that statement even if they're not excited by it? Raise your hands high. Good. Um, let's see. How many people have taken, so how many people have taken a full year of standard freshman physics? Whatever that means to you. You know, the one where you do the stupid block sliding down the stupid inclined planes and you <laughs> do like, Max, I don't know, you do uh, Maxwell's equations and, and stuff like that. Have you guys all taken that? How many people know Maxwell's equations? How many people could write down Maxwell's equations if I asked them to and said they'd fail if they couldn't do it? Okay. How many people could write down one of Maxwell's equations? Interesting. Um, let's see. How many people have seen special relativity in one form or another? Raise your hand. High, higher, higher, very high. Okay. How many people have seen the Lorentz transformations? Few of you. Okay, you'll see them again. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, let me just say a word about the textbooks. So, uh, frankly, um, this is a slightly strange class. Um, because uh, in some ways, this is a highly non-self-contained class. Um, the point of this class is not to take any one subject and to delve into it uh, with a great deal of depth, but rather to introduce you to a broad range of uh, subjects in modern physics, including relativity, uh, cosmology, quantum mechanics, atomic physics, and whatever else I feel like teaching. Um, and so, uh, for that reason, I think the textbooks for courses like this tend to be pretty poor, frankly. Um, so this, the textbook that I'm going to use for this course is this one by uh, Bernstein and friends. Um, it's pretty good. Um, I think it's the best of a bad lot, frankly. Um, I, it has the right material at more or less the right level. But I spent a while looking at various modern physics textbooks, and I didn't find, I've never found any uh, one that really uh, excites me. Um, so for that reason, I'm really not going to, I'm not going to follow the, the textbook particularly closely. Um, I really, I'm going to be writing my own lectures, um, teaching it the way that I damn well please. Uh, uh yes, question. Sorry, darn well please, darn well please. Um, yeah, good question. The question is whether it's necessary to get the textbook. I, I can't, you know, necessary. What's necessary? I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. Tell, I'm not going to fail you if you don't get the textbook. You might fail yourself. Uh, um, I did put the textbook on reserve at the library. Um, I know you can get it online for a lot cheaper than it is at the bookstore. Um, I encourage you to get the textbook. Um, a fair number of the exercises are taken from the textbook, but you know you can always just go to the library and copy down the exercises if you want. Um, I feel like. Uh, it would be unfair of me to not have a textbook because it's nice to have something to hold on to. Um, you know, like, even though I don't follow the textbook super closely, I am careful to use the same notation as the textbook, which I think is actually pretty important and, and good. And I think it's really important to have something that you can read, uh, which is an alternative to the explanations that I give, because not every explanation works for every person. So I think it's important to have a textbook. I'm not in love with this particular Bernstein textbook, um, but I do recommend that you get it. Okay. But you could always just try and use it for the library for the first few weeks, see if, that, if that's a total pain, you could get it. If it's fine, then it's fine. Um, I mean, the exams are all closed book exams, so it's not like you need it to take an exam anyway. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, so um, the first third of the course is on special relativity, and I actually like the treatment of special relativity in uh, Morin's book on classical physics better than I do in any of the modern physics textbooks. Uh, that's the textbook for your uh, classical mechanics class. 
So actually, for the first third of the class, a better reference is this book by Morin, as opposed to the book by Bernstein. Um, again, uh, most of you probably, almost all of you have it because you're taking the, the, the classical mechanics class. If you don't, you don't need to buy it. You can, it's on reserve at the library. But I think it's a slightly better reference uh, than the one by um, Bernstein and friends. Um, the other reference that I think actually is really quite nice is that the first uh, couple lectures, I'm going to give you a, a little crash course on estimation methods in physics, uh, dimensional analysis. How many people know what I mean when I say the word dimensional analysis? Interesting. Okay, last year when I taught this class, nobody had any idea what I meant when I said dimensional analysis. In some ways, uh, that might be the most important thing you learn in this class. It's not really textbook material. Um, but I, I did find one nice textbook uh, that cover has a nice chapter on dimensional analysis. And the advantage is that it's available for free online. So you can follow the link uh, on the syllabus. It's also linked to on the course webpage. And check out the chapter on dimensional analysis on that, in that book. I think it's pretty nice. I actually really like that book. I think it's a great little, it's, it's like bedtime reading for uh, physicists. Um, yeah, it's good. Um, I've also listed a bunch of other really nice references, I think. I really love this little book by David Merman on, on, on special relativity. Um, it's not very mathematical. It's pretty conversational, um, but it's a great little book. Oh, another book that I forgot to write down there, but which is really wonderful, is Einstein's book on relativity. Uh, there's nothing more fun than learning um, at, the, at the feet of the master. Okay, um, So... Uh, you know, Einstein's book on relative, special, he has a couple of books, two books on special relativity, actually. Uh, well, one on special and general relativity, and one, I think, just on special relativity. They're both really lovely. Um, so they're really not suitable for a textbook or anything like that. But if you have uh, the interest uh, and the time, I'd recommend checking them out. Um, I've recommended here two other little modern physics uh, textbooks, sort of very similar to the one we're using in the class. Um, um, they're both pretty good. Um, they're both on reserve at the library. Um, and finally, uh, I like this book by George Gamow, which is just a nice popular book. Again, bedtime reading for physicists. Um, okay, uh, let me um, now just say a little bit of um, a word about what this course is um, and, and, and why you're all here. Uh, oh, yes. Um, so um, one of the problems with the physics curriculum is that um, it's front-loaded with a lot of really boring classes. Okay. Um, you know, I don't want to uh, say bad things about stupid blocks sliding down stupid planes and, and stuff like that, because you need to learn it. But uh, you do spend a lot of your time in the first couple of years of your physics undergraduate studies uh, studying basically 70, stuff that Isaac Newton figured out, you know, uh, 400 years ago, almost. And so um, I think it's a real shame uh, that uh, the way that our uh, physics curriculum is structured, the way that everyone's physics curriculum is structured, is that you don't get to the fun stuff, quantum mechanics, general relativity, cosmology, astrophysics, condensed matter physics, until really uh, quite late in your education. And so... Uh, the point, and so this has um, a couple of uh, unpleasant side effects, I think one of which is that um, undergraduates are sometimes frustrated that they're studying physics to learn all of this cool advanced stuff, but they have to keep waiting and waiting and waiting before they get to it. And um, the other, I, I think, unpleasant side effect is that um, you can get a little lost when you're studying all of this beautiful, wonderful classical uh, mechanics and electrodynamics and all of that stuff, uh, you can lose a little bit of perspective about which parts of this are important for later on in my physics career or later on in my life when I try and want to use this to, to actually do physics. Um, and so the goal of this course is to remedy uh, that situation to the extent that it's possible. So um, uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to throw you into the deep end. Uh, you're not ready for quantum mechanics. You're not ready for general relativity. You don't know all, you don't have all the background you need to fully appreciate those subjects. But what we're going to do here is give you a bit of a survey of these subjects, um, teach you what you can, introduce some basic notions, introduce some basic ideas, um, which will sort of um, 
uh, get, get the juices flowing and get you excited about learning these subjects in the future and put sort of the rest of you, the undergraduate curriculum maybe in context. Um, and really, uh, my goal here is to begin to take you from the 17th century to the 20th century, okay. maybe the 21st century, although that might be pushing it. Um, but uh, a lot of what's going to be, we're going to study in this class is um, really uh, what uh, physicists began to understand uh, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and so uh, that's still uh, almost 100 years ago, but it's much better than three or 400 years ago. Um, yeah, and in addition, I think, um, you know, one sort of uh, underlying goal of this course is not just to teach you information, but to teach you problem-solving techniques um, and to teach you the way, and to at least begin to teach you the way that physicists actually think about physics, as opposed to just uh, stupid blocks sliding down stupid inclined planes or something like that. Um, so uh, I've written here a very uh, 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 telegraphic outline of the course. Um, it's a little sketchy. Um, roughly speaking, the next couple lectures, I'll do uh, some general stuff, dimensional analysis, where are we going in this class, um, estimation techniques. Um, I'll spend another good chunk of the course on special relativity. Um, the special relativity portion of the course is going to be divided into two parts. Um, there's a part on the kinematics of special relativity, uh, Lorentz transformations, space-time, um, length contraction, time dilation, all that stuff. Before moving on to the dynamics of special relativity, uh, energy equals mc squared, mass, momentum, uh, um, scattering processes, and things like that. Um, then what I'll do is I'll move on to a discussion of general relativity, which is the extension of special relativity to include um, gravity. I'll talk a little bit about the curvature of space-time and about its implications, uh, the most important of which is for cosmology. Um, the section on special relativity is going to be quite precise um, because you are at a point in your careers where you should be able to understand everything about special relativity and understand it well. Um, the section on general relativity, general relativity is going to be a bit more uh, schematic. Um, because the math required for a full study of GR um, is a bit beyond you at this point. Um, but nevertheless, there are a lot of interesting th things to say, uh, especially about cosmology. Um, and then in the second half of the course, we're going to move on to quantum mechanics. Uh, so uh, I'll start out by discussing um, the Bohr model. How many of you have seen the Bohr model? Okay, good. Well, we'll uh, do it better. Um, we'll do a better job and put it in um, a, you know, a, a more of a, a context, hopefully, than you've seen it before, uh, before moving on to quantum mechanics. And so the last, I would say, third of this course is just going to be a kind of uh, schematic introduction to quantum mechanics um, and to its implications. And quantum mechanics is, to some extent, the subject in physics. Um, it is... Um, the, the most, I think, probably the most important subject that you will learn um, as undergraduates in a physics major. Um, and it's a difficult subject and one that takes a long time to wrap your heads around. And so that is a, a process that we will begin in this class, but one that will not end uh, for quite a while, uh, if it ever does. Um, and then I put special topics. I always put special topics at the end of a syllabus because it means that if I have time, I can talk about whatever I want to talk about. Any questions? No questions? Let me just say a word about uh, the way that I teach. Um, I understand that there are many people here uh, from a lot of different backgrounds, some people come SAGEP, some from U0, some from who knows where. Um, and so for that reason, I never quite know whether what I'm saying is hitting the mark or not. Um, and the only way that I know whether you are understanding uh, what I'm saying is if I get feedback from you. So for that reason, I really want to encourage all of you to ask lots of questions. I will be personally disappointed in each and every one of you if I do not get lots of questions. Okay, have I laid it on thick enough? Okay, so I want a question. Any questions? Yeah. 
Nope. Um, we will decide that um, uh, by a uh, quasi-democratic process, whereby you will vote on things and then I will make a decision because it's not a democracy. Um, but we'll, 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 we'll come to that uh, later on. I mean, we could decide it now for all I care. But, yeah, let's do it later. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Are you going to be introducing any real differential geometry for the zero section, or are you just going to hand wave it? Nah, I'll hand wave it. I mean, um, yeah, uh, as I said, GR is a topic that um, is mathematically, I mean, it's something that mathematically, if you wanted to spend a semester learning GR, if I wanted to spend this whole semester teaching you GR, I could teach you GR. Um, it's nothing, there's nothing too complicated about it. I mean, I think a high school student could learn general relativity um, if they put their minds to it. But it's the sort of thing that I don't think that we just have time to devote, a, you know, a full semester to studying. And so for that reason, I'm going to be a little sketchy. I'll introduce the vocabulary. I mean, frankly, a lot of this course is uh, about vocabulary. It's about my telling you words and saying those words often enough that later in life when you hear someone say that word, you're not scared. Okay, you think, oh... A geodesic. I've heard of a geodesic. It's this thing in GR that tells me how objects move when space curves. And you don't necessarily need to know the geodesic equation or the Christoffel connection or anything fancy like that, but you'll have the basic idea. Okay. And you'll more importantly know where you can look to find out more. And that place, of course, is Wikipedia. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. any, other, any other questions? Yeah. No other questions. Yes. Uh, when you say that uh, like, certain subjects will be like, like in the mathematical stuff, does yeah. that mean there's going to be like written questions? No, this is a physics course. So that everything's, you know, the ex you know, I mean, uh, there's no written, uh, yeah, there are no essay questions in this course. Um, it does mean, it, you know, I will give you bits and pieces of the mathematics that you need. Um, I will do my best to make this course self-contained. Uh, to some extent, that's a real challenge for me for a course like this. Um, I actually, uh, for a long time, advocated canceling this course. Uh, cause I, but, <laughs> so I think that uh, I was then asked to teach it. Um, it's a bit of cosmic justice. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think that, uh, because I think this is an unusual course, okay, um, because it is not... Uh, a, the standard physics course, you systematically develop everything from the beginning to the end of a subject, and you end up with a nice, coherent, beautiful picture. Um, and we, and that's what we'll do for special relativity. We'll start at the beginning, we'll end at the end, and at the end of the day, we'll have some beautiful physics that we can understand completely. Okay. Um, but that will only take us four weeks. Okay. Um, and so then we'll go on and do a little bit more of a survey of these various different topics. But no, we don't do essay questions. Uh, we do math. And we do physics. Okay. Because we're a real physicist. Any other questions? Yes. What is my field of research? My field of research is theoretical particle physics, string theory, black holes, quantum cosmology. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about my field of research, but actually what I've done in the past is that as a reward, the lecture after the midterm, I uh, will give a talk about my research. <laughs> I know you all must be as fascinated by it as I am. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm happy to talk about my research, but um, and it's, if you want me to stop talking about whatever I'm talking about, a good way of doing that is asking me about my research. And I say, Alex, tell me about the quantum mechanics of black holes. I'll immediately drop whatever I'm doing. But no, uh, but let's talk about uh, modern physics instead. Any other questions? Good. Please interrupt me and ask questions at any point. Um, okay. So now my computer is asleep. Yeah, see, this is why I promise, are you awake? That I'm not going to reliably record the lectures. Is this thing on? It's, okay. okay. Ah. There we go. Yeah, I can't wait until... Apple makes one of these things. 
and then um, it will just work. Okay, good. So um, what is the goal of this class? So um, the goal of this class is to go beyond the standard picture of Newtonian physics um, that you've learned so far in your classes, for example, on classical mechanics. So our goal is to go beyond Newtonian physics. And so what do I mean by Newtonian physics? Well, I mean the classical laws of motion, F equals MA, and all of the various weird and wonderful consequences thereof. And before diving into any particular details of relativity or quantum mechanics, I would just like to set the stage for you a little bit and talk about the types of modifications to Newtonian physics that we will be discussing in this course. And I would like to give you a few methods for at least estimating the basic strength and size of these modifications to Newtonian physics. And there are really two types of uh, effects that we will be discussing. And these are really the two substantial modifications to no Newtonian physics that were discovered in the early 20th century, namely modifications of Newtonian physics due to quantum effects and modifications due to relativistic effects. And before even describing in detail what the nature of these effects are, I think it's important to step back a little bit and ask under what circumstances these effects will be important. Because learning special relativity is all well and good, but if you just want to understand, for example, the amount of time it will take for this box of chalk to hit the floor if I drop it, then you need to understand, you need to understand why it is you don't need to know special relativity or quantum mechanics or nuclear physics or anything like that in order to estimate the amount of time it'll take for this box of chalk to hit the floor. But I'm not going to actually drop it. Um, so uh, in order to do so, um, what I want to do is uh, spend the first two or three lectures discussing dimensional analysis. And dimensional analysis is the tool that we will use to analyze uh, the strength of these effects. which are governed by two parameters. The strength of relativistic effects is go are governed by uh, a quantity called C, which is the speed of light. And the strength of quantum effects is governed by a quantity we call H, which is Planck's constant. And so if you want to understand whether, for example, special relativity is going to be relevant when considering a given physical situation, the question you need to ask yourself is, are the typical velocities that are arising in this problem greater than or of order the speed, or less than or of order the speed of light. So for example, if I drop a piece of chalk from here onto the floor, then the typical velocity, the velocity of that uh, object as I drop it is far, far, far below the speed of light, which means that the strength of relativistic effects are going to be very small. Um, and, uh, on the other hand, for example, if I take this piece of chalk and I drop it into a black hole, okay, then the strength of relativistic effects will be quite important. And so um, our goal then is just to develop a little bit of intuition for estimating the size of these effects. So let me just uh, tell you uh, some vocabulary. I told you this was a course on vocabulary. So uh, let me draw an axis here. Okay, this is not a schematic plot. This is a moral plot. The vertical axis is special is relativity. So as you increase along the vertical axis, relativistic uh, effects become important. And as you increase 
along the horizontal axis, quantum mechanics effects become important. So here in uh, the lower left-hand corner, where neither effect is important, the laws, classic, the laws of physics are governed by the laws of classical mechanics. And then, as relativistic effects become more important, uh, special relativity takes over. So, for example, uh, if the velocity of uh, the object that you're considering is of order of the speed of light, then special relativity rather than classical mechanics is the appropriate set of rules of physics to use. Whereas, if quantum mechanics uh, become important, then classical mechanics is replaced by quantum mechanics. That's why it's called quantum mechanics. And then, if both uh, relativistic and quantum mechanical effects are important, then uh, we have up here in the upper right-hand corner uh, particle physics. Well, it has this, a field which has a lot of different names. You could call it relativistic quantum mechanics, or you could call it quantum field theory, or you could call it particle physics. Uh, they're all more or less uh, different terms for the same thing, which is the theory of physics that uh, is needed to describe situations where both relativity and quantum mechanics are important. And it's important to emphasize, of course, that it's not that Newton's laws are wrong. It's just that they have a regime of validity which is governed by those two parameters, C and H, that I drew at the top of this slide. And in order to estimate the size of these effects, it's useful to use dimensional analysis. And dimensional analysis is a very fancy term for a very, very simple yet powerful idea. So, in order to explain dimensional analysis to you, let me, remind, let me remind you of something that you already know, which is that many physical quantities that we will be concerned with in studying a given physical problem are measured in some system of units. For example, you might measure the length of some object. And if you're using the SI system of units, you would measure its length in meters. Whereas if you're using the CGS system of units, you would measure it in centimeters. Whereas if you were measuring the mass of the object, you would measure that either in kilograms or in grams, or an interval of time would be measured in either seconds uh, or seconds. The joke is seconds is the same. Okay, never mind. Um, and um, these three different units, length, mass, and time, are the basic sets of units out of which all other quantities that we are interested in studying in physics uh, are defined. Well, there are other sorts of units, such as for charge and so forth, which one can add in addition to this. But as far as studying um, uh, mechanics, uh, these are the three basic quantities of interest. So let me now introduce a bit of terminology. So a quantity which is the same in every system of units is called dimensionless. And a quantity which is not the same is called dimensionful. For example, the length of this pen is a dimensionful quantity because uh, in the SI units, I would measure it in meters. 
whereas in the CGS units, I would measure it in centimeters. And those two uh, numbers would differ by a factor of 100. So the length of this pen is a dimensionful quantity. Whereas the ratio of the length of a pen to a length of a piece of chalk is a dimensionless quantity. That ratio is the same no matter what system of units I use to make those measurements. The factor of 100 would cancel. And so, so for example, we often use um, a little piece of notation when describing the dimensions of various objects. So a linear size or length of an object has dimension, well, it has dimension length. And so if, for example, you're measuring the radius of an object r, and you want to remind yourself that it has dimensions length, we would say that we would put, uh, well, I guess there are a variety of different notations that people use. Uh, the notation that is most common is you would put the quantity in brackets and say it goes like length, you know, the little squiggly sign meaning that it goes like, uh, I didn't teach you that in math class, uh, L for length, whereas, for example, uh, an area has dimension length squared so that the area of some object goes like length squared. And uh, a length of time, likewise, would have uh, dimensions of time. Uh, a mass would have dimensions of mass. So we could also, uh, you know, the length of time would go like time, and a mass would go like mass. But we also have various derived quantities. which are built up out of these three basic dimensions, length, mass, and time. So, for example, the velocity of an object will go like length divided by time because it is the distance that an object will travel uh, in, per, in a given amount of time. And so the velocity of an object is dimension full but the ratio of the velocity of an object to the speed of light is dimensionless because it's a velocity divided by a velocity. The lengths cancel and the times cancel. Uh, energy, for example, has dimensions. Who, who can tell me what the dimensions of energy are? Hint, mc squared. Energy has dimensions of uh, mass times velocity, so mass times length squared divided by time squared. Um, the quick and dirty way of figuring out the dimensions of your favorite quantity in physics is to just remember your favorite physics formula and uh, use that. Um, so for example, uh, if you want to figure out the dimensions of force, F equals MA. A is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So it has dimensions of uh, length over time squared. So force has dimensions of mass times acceleration. So mass length over time squared. Uh, how about, let's do another example, density. The density of an object is the amount of mass per unit volume. So that will have dimensions of mass over length cubed. Volume, of course, going like length cubed. And the important point, the point that I cannot stress enough, is that any physical law should be independent of the system of units used to write that law. So in particular, any valid physics equation, say A equals B, 
should relate quantities with the same units. And um, a corollary of this observation is that any physical law can be written in terms of dimensionless quantities. Um, to see why that's true, let's imagine that we have a physical law, A equals B, where A and B both have dimensions of length, for example. Then, in order to write that in terms of dimensionless quantities, just rewrite that as A divided by B equals 1. So A and B both have dimensions of length. A over B is dimensionless. And very often, the best way of understanding the physics of a given uh, system is to write everything in terms of dimensionless quantities and then try and understand how those dimensionless quantities are related to one another. And the important point is that this observation, that every law of physics relates quantities with the same, uh, with the same dimension, constrains the possible laws of physics. So this constrains the possible laws of physics. Um, for example, it tells us that no law of physics involves the exponential of a length. It's a, why? Well, what is, let's imagine that I have a, a quantity, say, uh, the length of a piece of chalk, L. And I want to write down a physical law that is obeyed by this piece of chalk. Say, a law describing its rotation as I subject it to some forces or something like that. Then, the exponential of that length of a piece of chalk, well, what is the exponential? Its definition is in terms of a Taylor expansion. 1 plus L plus 1 half L squared plus dot, dot, dot. This involves the addition of something with dimension 1 plus something with dimension length, or something dimensionless, rather, something which has dimension 1, plus something with dimension length, plus something with dimension length squared, and so on and so forth. So any law which involves only the exponential of uh, the length of the piece of chalk can't possibly be written in terms of... Uh, uh, can't possibly relate only quantities which have the same dimension. So this is no good. But what could make sense, for example, is an exponential of the length of the piece of chalk divided by some other length scale. Okay, so if you have another length scale in the problem, another quantity with dimensions of length in the problem, then this, of course, is the exponential of a dimensionless quantity. So it's dimensionless, and this is okay. So a quick and dirty way of understanding whether any result that you have derived in some problem set, for example, uh, is plausible, is to check that it only relates quantities which have the same dimension. And then, uh, along with um, this uh, observation, that the laws of physics um, uh, only relate quantities with the same uh, dimension, we have two basic principles. The first is the principle of dimensional analysis, and the second is, I guess I would call it a principle, uh, it's more a, a dirty trick which is that for obtaining order of magnitude estimates. So I will just say them in words, um, although we'll encounter them more uh, next class. 
But the principle of dimensional analysis says that if you have a problem involving a bunch of physical quantities, but it's only possible to form one dimensionless combination of these quantities, then that dimensionless combination must be a constant. Likewise, if you are trying to solve some physics problem and you can only form two dimensionless quantities from all of the various inputs to your problem, then that one of them must be a function of the other. So if you, I want you to think about this and think about why it is that this is a consequence of the observations about physical laws that I've made earlier in this class. And then the second principle that I've written here, that of order of magnitude estimates, is the statement that in general, if you have a dimensionless quantity, one of the, 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 the pieces of uh, truth in physics uh, is that if you have a dimensionless uh, combination of quantities, then most likely it's of order one. And if it's not of order one, there better be a good reason. Okay. So let me give you an example. The uh, rules of physics, the basic laws of physics, are governed by three dimensional quantities. The speed of light, Planck's constant, and Newton's constant, which determines the strength of gravitation. From those, one can construct one and only one length scale. Therefore, you would guess, based on this order of magnitude estimate, that the size of the universe should be this length scale. So your homework assignment, this is one of those homework assignments that's not on a problem set, but one that you do to become a better physicist, is to go and calculate that length scale and compare it to the size of the universe and see if this order of magnitude estimate uh, is true. Give you a hint. It's wrong. Okay. Um, it's uh, okay. So your homework problem is to figure out how many orders of magnitude it's off by. Okay. Give you a hint. Okay. I'll go look up the speed of light. Speed of light. Uh, what? Three times ten to the ten centimeters per second. Look up Newton's constant. Uh, look up Planck's constant. Form the dimensionless. Form the quantity uh, out of those three uh, objects, which has dimensions of length. Compared to the size of the universe, the universe is, what, 10 billion light years across? Just do it. It's a fun exercise. Um, that would be an example of when this order of magnitude estimate is wrong. That's a hint. Okay. Um, it's uh, uh, 125, uh, so I will go ahead and uh, end here. And um, see you guys uh, next class.